everybody, this is Alyssa Chu. I am the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan, also the co-host and curator for the session today. Anchor Taiwan is a platform focusing on ecosystem building and venture capital for cross-border innovation. It is with tremendous pleasure and honor to gather so many of you from around the world to talk about whether Asia is leading innovation. I remember a few years ago at Y Combinator's Demo Day, I often saw international teams adopting proven business models from the states and localizing in their home markets. For example, Uber for China, Airbnb for India, DoorDash for Indonesia, and so on and so forth. This international startup succeeded not because they came out with innovative business models per se, but because their home markets are simply big enough for them to enjoy the demographic dividend. However, in the most recent couple of years, I noticed that the trend has reversed. Now, I am seeing U.S. founders copying innovative business models from Asia. For example, Pinduoduo for the U.S. maternity markets, Meituan for U.S. teenagers, and so on and so forth. Is Asia now leading innovation? We used to look up to Silicon Valley as the only mega center for innovation. Can talents now from Asia drive meaningful disruption for the world to copy? A step further, can the world talent start coming to Asia to, to co-create the world's future from here? This is the sixth Asia Venturing session. Every month, we invite industry leaders from both East and West to share, inspire, and connect. Previously, we talked about the corporate venturing and CBC landscape in Asia, the future of mobility, how to innovate with traditional industries, how global unicorns leverage Asia from zero to exit, and whether the capital market is flat. You can find a recap and video replay throughout our social media channels and on YouTube. The Asia Venturing Sessions would not have been possible without our co-host and important partner, DigiTimes. Before we start, I would like to invite Eric Huang, Vice President at DigiTimes, to share a few insights on today's topic. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Alisa. Greetings, everyone. Alisa, Sasha, and Tina. Glad to have all of you joining the panel. I'm Eric Huang, Vice President of DigiTimes. I'm in charge of DigiTimes Asia and our research team to provide tech supply chain insight with an angle from Asia. Now we are in the 5G era. There's no doubt that Asia takes the lead in 5G. South Korea launched the world's first commercial 5G service in April 2019. China sped out the 5G timeline several times and launched the service in November 2019. It soon became the country with the most 5G subscribers in 2020. Based on latest mobility report, East Asia is expected to have 570 million 5G subscribers by year end. China will contribute to 460 million subscribers. In comparison, North America and Western Europe will only have 80 million and 31 million subscribers. Besides subscriber base, speed is also a critical criteria for innovative services. From the data released last month, South Korea is ranked number one and number nine for 5G download speed and upload speed. Taiwan is ranked number three and number two for 5G download speed and upload speed respectively. Asia also plays a significant role from the supply side to trigger innovation. The left figure shows the top countries by number of US granted patents in 2020. Japan, China, South Korea, and Taiwan rank number two, number three, number four, and number six, with the US itself leading the pack. Samsung Electronics, TSMC, LG Electronics, and the Huawei Technologies are the number two, number six, number seven, and the number nine patent assignees. TSNC invented immersion lithography to realize advanced semiconductor technology, which is one of the greatest technological innovation in the first 10 years of 21st century with tremendous contribution to the global society. With good demand-side, supply-side dynamics, 
under the support of world-class information and communication infrastructure. I believe more and more to see and to be digital innovations will originate in Asia and spread to the world in near future. Now back to you, Alisa. Thanks, Eric. Now, without further ado, let's get into the main session. We're really, really honored and delighted to have two very interesting speakers. Tina Lin from Google Taiwan and also Sasha Pellenberg from AWARE. Now, maybe let's invite them to give us a quick introduction of themselves first. Sasha, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Elisa. My name is Sasha Pallenberg. Uh, I live here in Taiwan for more than 12 years. I'm now the Chief Awareness Officer for AWARE, which is Germany's uh, first sustainability platform. And in my previous job, I worked for Daimler, which is the roof company of Mercedes-Benz as the head of digital transformation. And I was actually also a founder over here in Taiwan by founding Mobile Geeks, with, which was a media outlet. Uh, which was all about uh, mobile technology and therefore I'm especially honored to be here in the Digital Times headquarters and to talk to you guys. Thank you, Sasha. How interesting that you have been based in Taiwan, but basically working for Daimler and also this international company yeah. for digital transformation. So really curious about your observations during your time here in Asia and specifically from Taiwan. Thank and you. Tina, how about you? Uh, hi everyone, this is Tina from Google Taiwan. Uh, I'm born and in, in educated in Taiwan, but um, all my career is starting from software, hardware, and even now internet. It's all about the global economy and also try to see how we can have the international business development over the world. And now I'm a, a general manager for Google Taiwan and also uh, in charge of the sales operation and business development in Taiwan. I love that, woman in tech, <laughs> and we're going to have, I think, a very interesting conversation here because normally, I guess, you know, you don't see someone like Sasha and Tina together, especially on this topic. So I personally am super excited about this upcoming session. And by the way, if you're online, feel free to say hi to each other. And also during the session, feel free to post your questions during Q&A. We have half an hour reserved for that at the end so that you can really interact with our speakers. Now, my first question. I guess, you know, before we go into any further serious discussion, on today's topic is Asia leading innovation. I'm curious from what you see, either from big corporates like Google or for Sasha previously a big corporate and now with this very specific platform for sustainability from Asia, without naming your own products or your own business, can you tell me one either product or business model or trend or campaign or anything from Asia that you think is truly exciting and groundbreaking when it comes to innovation? Maybe let's start with Sasha. Well, I would love to refer to Eric's opening remarks uh, when he was just describing um, the 5G landscape over here. I have to mention um, a company like TSMC because especially the semiconductor industry, which is somewhat of the backbone of the Taiwanese ecosystem, really changed the world as a whole. Um, without this, we wouldn't be in this environment that we can live in right now, where it is just possible to be wherever in the world and I can immediately start a full HD uh, stream or maybe with 5G now even 4K, right, which kind of changes the world from a kind of consumer perspective into a content creator perspective. And this all came out of Asia. I think the competition that was created, especially here in Taiwan over the last decades, really helped to fuel up this industry, to come up with all these amazing devices that we can use right now, and to actually make mobile computing available for the masses. I remember the first time I got to Taiwan in 2002 during Computex to speak at a developers conference at that time. Um, we were talking about how we're going to enable the next billion people because at that time we had roughly about one billion PCs in the market and we weren't even thinking about you know how the 
mobile computing revolution which changed the landscape even though at that time a company like HTC for example already built kind of uh, mobile devices and handsets for Compaq and Dell and HP and whatnot. So but then out of a sudden in, obviously in 2007 the whole world changed when Steve Jobs announced the very very first uh, iPhone and this was just heavily built on the backbone of this industry. So I, it's a very, very meta perspective, right, that I'm giving you. But I still believe at the end of the day, um, the world is uh, run on silicon mm -hmm. and uh, most of this silicon is being produced over here. So I'm hearing two key things. One is that innovative business model started from TSMC. I would love to invite you to share a little bit further after we hear from Tina, yeah. for the audience who may not be super familiar with what kind of disruption they came out with that really enabled the world to get online. Because I think a lot of people forget that we used to you know, be very analog. How does the entire world mm -hmm. get into, you know, like now we're you know, with our phone everywhere, with really like a computer with, with us everywhere. So TSMC and also I think this whole hardware supply chain that enables really this affordable affordability for our devices. I think that's also a key. And I will also get back to you because I want to know also specifically in more recent years, can you name me one thing that excites you either from Taiwan or Asia? But I will come back to you on that. How about you, Tina? What do you think? On top of what uh, Tash, uh, Sasha just shared about the, the latest development on the hardware or you know, all this infrastructure, and I want to point out uh, some consumer mm -hmm. trend and also application. Maybe like one thing about show radio, and I think it's also come with very uh, solid and also robust infrastructure. So the consumer can easily write on 5G or mobile, can consume the video, which probably is totally different from the past, because they can easily access the content and also create content on, on top of this it, on top of all this infrastructure. So I think this is something uh, leading from Asia and even change whole consumer behavior, especially for younger generations. Great. I'm also hearing a few very important keywords, infrastructure, population, and also just very young demographic. So now we are really in a way, redefining the world consumer trends. And we'll get back to that to get into a little bit further in terms of why Asia is leading, really, in this game. But coming back to you, Sasha. So first of all, um, you know, can you educate our audience a little bit when it comes to the business model and also your own observation in terms of what you see in Asia in recent years? Because TSMC, they have been around for quite some time. So yeah, they've been around for quite some time, right? But basically in the public eye under the radar. And I think just in recent years, uh, more and more people have figured out uh, what an amazing global leader we have here in Taiwan. Um, when you look at where we were, were, the situation where we were coming from, like uh, let's say 20 to 30 years ago, um, in these high times of the PC industry, where usually about 300 million units were sold into the market each and every year, this was all x86, so the architecture that Intel and AMD, and also, uh, by the way, a Taiwanese company with VR technologies used at that time. When we switched over into RISC processors, so the ARM uh, architecture, that all our mobile devices are using right now. There was just this company coming up and um, that was a TSMC because out of a sudden they were capable to come up uh, with new innovations around this, highly integrated chipsets, especially I think we were coming out of an era where we were always talking about the sheer power of a computer, right? How much faster can it get? And we had this race for power. But no one was really talking about efficiency. Um, to embrace mobile computing, to be capable of using a mobile device wherever we are, this is all about efficiency. That means performance per watt. And when we saw these evolutionary steps that companies like TSMC made, and we should never ever underestimate one thing. They also needed competition, right? Uh, competition is always good for, for OEMs and for consumers in general. 
there was a huge competitor in South Korea, which is which is Samsung, right? And somewhat, especially for a company like Apple, if I can use them uh, as an example, um, the way they had to look at the supply chain, they were uh, um, um, designing their own SOCs, and then they were basically going to TSMC, hey, we need maybe 150 million of these SOCs, can you produce them? Yeah. At what price? Okay. And then they flew over to South Korea and talked to Samsung, uh, this is what we need, uh, can you produce them? Yes. What's the price? So that's the competition we needed in this market. And of course, then we have the, all the other players, right? Um, but now, well, we have to What's still puzzling me, right, and even though I've been using these devices for so long, and I, be, I think the first time I got online was in 85, pre-World uh, um, Wide Web, what's still puzzling me, now I have a device in my pocket, yeah, that is as powerful as a PC like six or seven years ago, that only uses like a 20th of the power consumption, and now with 5G, I have a faster internet while I'm on the road than I have on my cable at home. Mm. And I think sometimes we forget about what led us to this mm. innovation and especially how many companies are also involved in the supply chain. For a phone, we're talking about roughly two to 200 to 300 uh, uh, different companies from all over the world. And, um, now we have a device where we can access um, the wisdom of mankind wherever we are. We can even talk to the rest of the world wherever we are. And I think that's amazing. Exactly. And I guess, you know, I'm hearing efficiency. And I think for a lot of Taiwanese companies, these OEM, ODM models to really divide maybe kind of like branding, consumer facing versus just really, really specific expertise when it comes to manufacturing. I think that's probably something that's very often overlooked because when yeah. it comes to the supply chain, people only care about it when something doesn't work. The most ideal scenario is that it works perfectly, so it basically just works at the background. So I think that's also why this COVID brought so much attention to Taiwan, to TSMC, and so on and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, efficiency and how do we really enable the whole world population in the past to get mobile. And I think the next we're hopefully going to talk a little bit more around that is how do we actually enable the world population to move from the traditional cars into EV electric vehicles? I think it's the same logic and I'm really looking forward to seeing the contribution from Asia from here. So coming back to you, Tina, you mentioned short videos and also this elements in Asia that kind of like contributed to that. I would love to actually quote uh, an article from your Asia, so the like APAC president previously, where he mentioned uh, in Asia when it comes to gaming, payments, and also just kind of like it, in these areas, especially Asia is really leading e commerce as well. And I often actually uh, tell a lot of audience that may not be so familiar with this part of the world, even when it comes to Google Play contribution. Taiwan consistently ranked, I think, top five. Yep. Still, the most recent number I didn't check, but consistently, I think, usually is top five. Such a small island with 23 million population. But not just that, when it comes to just gaming, I think three out of four biggest markets in the world are located in Asia. You know, when it comes to e-commerce, similarly, we can find stunning numbers to really emphasize the importance of Asia. Can we dig a little bit more into why that's the case from your observations with obviously Google Play and so on and so forth, but just also in general when it comes to e-commerce payment and such? Mm -hmm. I want to start from, uh, definitely start from the population that actually Asia account for like 60% population all over the world. And not to mention among all this population, 40% are under 25 years old. So it's a very young population. And you can imagine like uh, the younger population, they're also more open-minded to embrace the new technology. And as just Sasha just mentioned that among all this Asia population, and 98% are all on mobile internet. So all this 
echo to what Sasha mentioned. All based on all this infrastructure, you can imagine why all this application and innovation. Because based on all this infrastructure, then we can provide more uh, mobile friendly. All the innovation, no matter on payment, gaming, and e-commerce, is all riding on all this uh, environment. And not to mention the younger population embrace all this new application faster than the other regions. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, like it seems like for for Google, not only when it comes to kind of like the hardware, software, basically now is a total package and total solution when it comes to serving the population here. You know, with your phone, um, you know, like I think the Pixel Six just came out relatively recently and also the cloud service data center and so on and so forth. We're going to get into that um, a little bit deeper afterwards. And how about you, Sasha? Why do you think Asia is driving this very fundamental and important change in the world? I like what Tina mentioned before, and she's absolutely right. Um, there's a huge part of this population, and then I want to come back to uh, my remarks about how we're going to enable the next billion people. Um, a huge part of this young population over here basically leapfrogged the PC era. Right. They out of a sudden had a chance to now get connected and use a device um, that is as powerful as a PC, but they could still put it into their pocket. On top of that, well, obviously you can tell by my weird accent uh, that I'm not from here or from the US, but from Germany. I, I could never ever imagine a situation in Germany where I see a public transport bus driving through the city with, um, I don't know, uh, a, a commercial or advertisement of the latest mobile game. Or I remember a time um, there was a lounge in, in, in Shanghai about a new mobile game and they made a, a, a QR code out of three and a half thousand drones and put it into the skyline of Shanghai so that everyone could just basically point their phones to it and immediately download this game. There is just no other environment in this world. Heavily driven by this young population heavily driven by something that is somewhat kind of changing the way we're going to look at the monetization of technologies right now. I mean, we've been talking about platform economy for quite a while. Uh, what you look at, the uh, major players uh, in the platform economy, let's once again, let's take these guys from Cupertino. Um, the revenue of Apple uh, for the iPhones is about $120 billion a year. Uh, when it comes to the App Store, it's about $60 billion a year. So is this actually a platform economy or is it more about selling platforms, right? Because still right now, hardware is uh, still generating the bigger revenue. But we see a younger, uh, a younger population right now that are actually changing their mindset towards digital goods in general. Uh, when I grew up, it was probably all about when you got at school, what kind of shoes were you wearing, right? What kind of shirts do you have or whatnot? And some of we try to kind of value and kind of judge the rank of somewhat in your uh, community. And now the younger kids, right? For them, it's important what kind of cape they wear in a mi on a Minecraft uh, server, right? I remember that like 20 years ago, um, I bought a magical axe on eBay for Diablo 2, which was a game. When my girlfriend asked me if I really paid for euros, like for real currencies, for this digital good, well, that was the end of our relationship because she thought I'm absolutely crazy, right? But, but, but now we have a new generation that is actually figuring out what it means, what a platform economy would mean, could be, what is something what we now coin as the metaverse would actually look like because they've been already using this for many, many years. This is driven by Asian people. This is driven by a very, very young generation. And it's taking the Western world by storm. And I think this is one of the most innovative innovative technologies. Or let's say, you know, it's, it, it is more like a lifestyle that, that, that's even more important. And it comes from Asia and it will change the world as we know it. And it comes once again out of the gaming industry. And I love that. That's great. And I'm hearing actually probably two main things. One is that with this open 
um, kind of like mindedness that both Tina and Sasha mentioned, it seems like the product life cycle in Asia is a lot faster. So consumers are a lot more open-minded when it comes to trying new things. Uh, maybe also more forgiving when it comes to, oh, this doesn't work, that's okay, you know, like, we're gonna try something new next time. And then so, you know, like very often in Asian markets, you see that we don't like, say for example, in Taiwan, for example, like we embrace Line, we embrace Facebook, Google, and you know, all of these different platforms. We don't necessarily need to stick with our own, um, you know, like um, platform or products, because, you know, like we're happy to try whatever that works. So one is that speed and that kind of like, uh, velocity in terms of new cycles. And the other one that I'm hearing from both of you is because of this young population, we're really driving this new behavior. So uh, I'm actually curious in terms of what Tina sees, whether you also see this as well, because Sasha, you mentioned this revenue sort of like um, breakdown when it comes to the contribution for Apple. So hardware probably, um, you know, like, weights still quite meaningfully, but increasingly we're seeing more and more contributing from the digital goods or data. I think we're seeing similar trends, even when it comes to EV with Tesla and so on and so forth as well. Now they're selling cars, but in the future, I think it's really more of a data play and you know, like other digital contribution. Um, before we move on to the next topic, I wonder for Tina, do you also see, obviously you might not be able to comment on specific numbers for Google, but I'm curious in terms of the train, mm. do you also see that and maybe a little bit of observation from your end? Um. I think there's another uh, stake I want to share is uh, we, we are talking about population, but we also sometimes miss the cultural element. And uh, I'm not sure uh, what the audience online can guess what's the most top four native speaking language in the world. I'm gonna put Sasha you on can, the spot. You can, you can take a guess. And, and maybe our audience online, you can actually put in the chat the most four, top, top four, four native speaker native language. Speakers yeah. language. Well, I know, I know what's number one, right? That's for sure. Uh, that's Mandarin. Mandarin, all right. Yeah. Any other guess? got it. <laughs> and, well, I can only lose, I guess, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what, what about what about Spanish, Indonesian, yes, Spanish? Yes, 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 yes. And because also of the Philippines, right? Oh. And, and and Indonesian. The the top four languages. The first one definitely Mandarin, uh, Chinese, and second one Spanish, mm. and third one English, and fifth actually is Hindi. Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yes. See, I so told you I can only lose on this one. <laughs> so you can imagine like uh, all these top four languages you it mostly come from mm -hmm. Asia. Yes. yes. And, and, and sometimes the technology or the scalability, it de definitely uh, impact by cultural elements. Right. And the interaction language, it also accelerate the transformation and also make a certain impact to the world. Mm -hmm. And not to mention there's a lot of immigrants over the world yeah. and it will influence the uh, consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we uh, specifically talk about the hardware devices, but some, I think the cultural element is also one key thing that you can uh, uh, speed up all the spread for the old innovation all over the world. That's a very yeah. important point, you know, in terms of immigrants in the world, definitely because, you know, there is a huge percentage from Asia, and yeah. I think they probably bring their innovative mindsets around the world. Risk-taking. Exactly, <laughs> risk-taking is like this kind of like, as a pioneer going wherever, you know, um, they need to be to, to really make it work for business or for their life. So that's, that's very um, crucial, I think, when it comes to this cultural element. If we were to come back a little bit on this software, hardware kind of like breakdown, what would be your observation or maybe your prediction in terms of going forward? Do you also see that the software or the non-hard part component is also going to be bigger and bigger when it comes to like proportion-wise when it comes compared with the hardware components? Mm. What we see because all just like what Sasha mentioned that all the uh, application rely on hardware's capability to deliver that. 
but hardware innovation also uh, driven by the software <laughs> application to make them to move faster. So I won't see, I don't, I won't see say, okay, what's the portion between these two? Mm. I really think all these two need to coexist and or co-create mm. together because uh, that's a certain uh, reason they want to move the technology forward. And if you just make something, okay, so powerful, but no application to, to fasten, I, I think that right now, uh, what uh, some uh, state also talk about 5G penetration, yeah. but what right now is still lack of some new, new, new application on 5G right now to fasten and also accelerate the 5G uh, adoption. I think that, that this is just one example to say, okay, software, hardware, they kind of really, you know, rely on and co-dependent to I each other. I love that because yeah. I guess, you know, like very often we're so, maybe like too black and white or white and narrow-minded when it comes to, oh, it's either hardware or software. But I think you made a brilliant point, not just when it comes to 5G. If we will look at, to look at AR, VR, same stories, right? Like we need the content, the software part to catch up for it to really work. So this co-independency, is really the key and I think that brought me to the next question for Tina when it comes to hardware software integration because in the last few years or even decade I think Google has been really increasing your investments and, and contribution here in Taiwan maybe some of our audience online may not be so familiar but you know you acquire the mobile phone um, segment of HTC you build your data center in Zhanghua and I think last year or the year before, you started this new campus in Banqiao. Can you first share with us a little bit in terms of this uh, for our audience online who may not be super familiar in terms of Google's presence here in Taiwan? And also maybe specifically around that, why did Google or why is Google still investing in Taiwan? What do you see in terms of what we have here to really kind of like um, bring your commitment and investments here? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, currently within Google, Taiwan has become the uh, number two uh, uh, largest tech site uh, in Asia. And in terms of hardware development, we are the biggest uh, hardware hub outside of the U.S. By the way, where is the biggest one? Uh, if you are talking about the biggest one still in India, in mm. terms of the uh, the employee size. Yeah. But yeah. hardware-wise? Mm. Hardware-wise, outside of the U.S., Taiwan is the biggest mm. one. Yeah. And um, there's a come many, many reasons that why we see the strengths, what Taiwan uh, has is, the first thing is definitely the talent. Sometimes uh, people will mistake and say, oh yeah, because the, the Taiwan talent is more economical. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in certain way that actually we did see the value what uh, Taiwan, Taiwan talent has. And not to mention in the world, um, not so many market or uh, country that you have so both software and hardware talent in mm. one place. Some market maybe they have software uh, talent, some market has hardware talent, but if you want to have just we call that coexist, actually Taiwan is a very, very rare uh, location that we have these two type of talent uh, together. And second thing is about the ecosystem. And the first Android native phone born in, in Taiwan, and the first Android, uh, at first uh, Chromebook also developed in Taiwan. Yeah. You can see this, uh, Taiwan has the strongest uh, ecosystem, no matter our mobile, laptop, and even not to mention, Sasha just mentioned the, the semiconductor ecosystem is probably the world-class yeah. uh, ecosystem in Taiwan. So the certain, uh, I would say the kind of like a village, Right within a small island, then we have software, hardware, ecosystem, talent, and it also creates certain velocity for all the collaboration among all this company to create something together faster than the other uh, location. And even though we talk about supply chain, but I also want to mention that uh, probably that's a one attribute I want to describe Taiwanese. I would say resilience. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. and. I think probably last year due to the COVID, and it's, we see that this is also one key attribute that Taiwanese can demonstrate it for the resilience. And I also see the supply chain also rely on resilience a lot, right? And, and 
given all this uh, good factor, and not to mention, uh, uh, Elisa just mentioned about the uh, uh, data center. Sometimes we, we also forget, actually Taiwan, we, we are staying in a very unique location between America to Asia. Mm -hmm. And if you, you, you want to take a flight outside of Taiwan within five hour range, you can easily access to Japan, Korea, and then five hours you can go to Indonesia and not to mention uh, our neighbor, China. Yeah. So I think if you just take this and you see, okay, we kind of really access to no most advanced economy and also emerging economy. I think we are kind of in the very, um, I would say very unique p position. And that's why we see there's uh, so many strengths and we continue to invest in Taiwan. So. And it, and it actually truly shows because the last uh, two years during the pandemic clearly showed uh, how well positioned uh, Taiwan is and was. Because I think you now this year they're going to once again announce um, a record growth here in this mm. country, which is also heavily based on on, 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 on on this industry. And you're absolutely... By the way, it was even the same uh, for the car industry uh, when it comes to what's your biggest market in terms of R&D and development. Um, the biggest R&D center outside of Germany, obviously, for Mercedes-Benz is in, in India, in Bangalore, with about 1,600, 1,700 engineers at their, at their center over there. It's, it, it, by the way, it's, it's also going to be really, really interesting how the car industry now has to look uh, at the supply chain over here in Taiwan and probably opening up or looking at new spots over here like you guys did already. So, yeah, I, I, I could fully agree with you on this, um, that especially the last two years, really showing the strengths of, of this ecosystem over here. Definitely. And, you know, like, I, I'm probably biased, but, you know, I definitely have a lot of faith in, in Taiwan's resilience and also what we can provide for yeah. the world. When it comes to supply chain, I want to change gear a little bit mm -hmm. for Sasha with what you are doing now and maybe in relation to what you used to do before mm -hmm. in the mobility sector. So, you know, aware this platform for sustainability and ESG, obviously a very, very important topic. But I would like to invite you to share your thoughts at the intersection of that and supply chains, because we're now sitting at this like very, very interesting island with, you know, powerful suppliers for the world in the past, as we talk about from phone to EVs. So can you share a little bit in terms of what you are seeing in that space, mm. in the mobility um, you know, sector, maybe with Daimler or other players, mm. and also what you see for the Taiwanese or maybe just suppliers in general, what mm. kind of role can we play to be a more active contributor when it comes to building a better tomorrow together? I truly believe that we are on the edge of a completely new era right now. Um, the world is going to change so significantly. This is going to be the new sustainable and green industrial revolution. Not only industrial revolution, it's going to be a revolution for all of us as a society. Um, when you look at all the regulators around the world and what kind of laws are getting into the markets and how different industries need to change to apply to these rules um, to fight the biggest challenge that mankind ever faced and which is basically to fight back this climate crisis mm -hmm. that we are in right now, to make sure that the climate crisis is not turning into a climate catastrophe because we already see these local catastrophes popping up all over the planet. So this will change supply chains as a whole. Um, you've mentioned um, the automotive industry. Well, I mean, even though that my, um, the former company that I worked for for four years uh, already had the first electric car about 130 years ago and they already supplied it for example thinking fire departments in Berlin at the beginning of the 20th century were using electric Mercedes-Benz at that time. Uh, the first Porsche was an electric car, the loaner Porsche, right? No one would ever imagine it right now. But um, to see What's happening right now, that we're switching 
into this era of e-mobility, which I absolutely love. You know, it's going to have a huge impact on our cities. Right? It's uh, in terms of pollution, emissions, in terms of noise pollution, which is also very, very important. And also especially for drivers, because um, electric cars are just so much fun to drive and much easier to handle as an internal combustion engine. Um, so the automotive industry as a whole made the decision. They believe in e-mobility. That means this is going to put quite some pressure on a supply chain, mm -hmm. right? Traditional suppliers that they're working on um, contributions uh, towards an internal combustion engine or a diesel uh, are now in a little bit of uh, different situation than they were for the last hundred years basically because that was the technology to go. Those OEMs, a company like Mercedes or a company BMW or the Japanese OEMs, the US American OEMs, they have to do that because otherwise they won't be allowed to sell their products in the future in specific markets. Can you remind us in terms of, say for example, uh, you, you're probably very familiar with Daimler's um, commitment or yeah. their goal. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good. I, I just, I would love to give you some two examples. So for example, um, a company like Porsche is aiming to be CO2 neutral on their balance sheet by the year 2030 which is quite a challenge. And uh, I'm not only saying this because Porsche is one of the strategic investors in uh, aware as a disclaimer, and I have to do that, obviously. Um, but I mean, each and over 70% of all historically built Porsches are still on the road, mm -hmm. which is also something about sustainability, right? When we talk about hardware, how long can I use hardware? So they are aiming for 2030. Um, Daimler, or now the Mercedes-Benz AG, because now they just split up last week mm -hmm. into Mercedes-Benz AG and Daimler Trucks, a uh, Trucks AG. Um, Mercedes-Benz is aiming for climate neutrality throughout the whole value and supply chain by the year 2039. This is 11 years before the, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. And it also gives you an idea of what's going to happen with the supply chain because for the automotive industry, for the, for the smartphone industry, we're talking about two, three hundred suppliers. For the automotive industry, we're talking about roughly 2,000 suppliers all around this planet. So these guys are going climate neutral and guess what they're going to do? They're going to put the pressure on the suppliers. So this is going to change the landscape. This is also going to create a massive amount of new opportunities to position yourself as a CO2, as a climate neutral. Well, uh, look at my wording, right? Uh, CO2 neutral on the balance sheet, climate neutral. This can all mean different things because especially at the beginning of this, we have to offset a lot of emissions until we're creating circular economies. But the pressure was, will go down to the supply chain and this always creates new opportunities. From what I hear so far, it seems like we are, you know, like now in a way being forced to do something. But then, are there active roles that we can take? And also, you know, when, when it comes to climate change and ESG and so on and so forth, obviously very important. But at the same time, it's such a loaded subject now you know, greenwashing, blah, blah, yeah, you know, yeah. like it's important, important, important. But, you know, like for some people, it's good to have maybe CSR. For some people, maybe it has real commercial sort of like impact. Can you give us an example, like for a supplier, right? Yeah. Let's say I'm a supplier, I'm a manufacturer in Taiwan. Yeah. What can we do, you know, instead of just waiting here and then being pushed by all of these global brands? Mm -hmm. Like, can you give me an example in terms of why I should actively try to do something? Well, well, first of all, as I said already, you know, we have regulators, we have OEMs. They're going to put uh, uh, pressure onto the supply chain. But there's also a difference here, and this is what I try to point out with these opportunities that are on these markets. Mm -hmm. Now imagine I kind of had this scenario before about these two big semiconductor uh, production juggernauts with TSMC and Samsung. 
right? Um, but now you have, as a supplier, also the chance. You have all these competitors all around the world. And all the suppliers, if any supplier is listening to us right now, you know how pressure feels when you're getting into the uh, negotiations with an OEM. And, but all of a sudden, you have a chance to position yourself as you know, a progressive leader in the sustainability industry, where you actually also position yourself not only over a fancy little PR purpose claim underneath your brand name, but you are actually proactively doing this. This will have an impact and an impression on your partners. And this is also a way for you to differentiate yourselves from your competitors. The earlier you start with this, the sooner you start with it, the bigger your competitive advantage will be. So I'm hearing basically this can be really a differentiator because yes. in the past, let's take TSMC and Samsung and maybe versus Apple as an example, they can be a lot of price war yeah. or price cutting with each other. But all of a sudden, if you have a different product that's better when it comes to ESG and so on and so forth, you differentiate yourself and then now it's no longer just a commodity, same as what other people can offer. So that's basically the key message that I'm hearing, I guess, for all of the suppliers and manufacturers out there to really think about. And we have about 10 minutes. I have one more question that I'm going to ask, but I would like to invite, I'm seeing quite a lot of good questions coming in already in our Q&A box. Now this is your time to really start putting your questions there in case you want our great speakers to answer your questions afterwards. But before we do that, I want, to, I want to pull it back to our opening questions when it comes to really the innovation from Asia. I invite you to share your thoughts without mentioning your own products or companies or your own experiences. But now I want to zoom in a little bit to specifically your personal experience or when it comes to what Google or Aware or Dimer has been building. So for Tina, from where you are sitting with Google's products in the world. Can you give us some examples? Specifically, when, when, when I walk out in the streets in Taipei, I can tell people over there, hey, guess what? This phone. By the way, can I, can I see that new um, Pixel phone? So can I, can I go out there and tell people, hey, this phone that a lot of people in the world are waiting to get, some part of that actually was contributed from a team here by maybe both Taiwanese and maybe even global talent. So I would love to hear a little bit more, like specific examples in terms of how we contribute to the world when it comes to this. Yeah, um, um, I'm not sure the audience have been know that uh, we just launched our Pixel 6 phone uh, this early this year. And um, if you will come to how we can uh, really make this into a reality, probably over 60% over of all the product development actually is kind of developed by a uh, team in Taiwan. And not to mention starting from product design, testing, and even that we have our own uh, uh, chipset tensor is also mainly uh, designed by uh, the team in Taiwan. So um, I, won't, I won't say that exactly, but I would say this is, count, if this phone, I, I would say the most uh, uh, team in Taiwan, we make it happen. And some of the features is also developed by Taiwan team that, for example, we have one uh, feature is for the disability people that for the, uh, their uh, uh, hearing loss. And, and this application is also designed by a team based in Taiwan. So I just want to mention uh, sometimes that people will say, okay, probably the, the team here is only for like some very um, downstream type of task. But actually, we st join stuff from scratch for the design and also the testing or all the development, enough to mention the ecosystem. So um, this is something I, I re we, we are really proud of uh, how the team uh, in Taiwan we can deliver. That's fantastic. And also, I think one thing that probably not a lot of people um, know is that Obviously, Team Taiwan, awesome, right? But you also actually have a lot of international talents in your office here in Taiwan as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will say that that's a ta talent, talent, talent wanted type of uh, message here. 
And um, previously, probably every time when we uh, speak with uh, uh, international talent, when they want to come to Asia, they would consider, okay, maybe Japan, maybe Singapore. But interestingly, uh, last year, we start, uh, Taiwan office, we start to uh, receive a lot of requests from uh, different offices all over the world. They want to apply the role in Taiwan. And, and, and one of the things I want to mention here is, uh, uh, that's also thanks to our government for the COVID uh, prevention. And yeah. Taiwan office is a very, very rare office in the world. We didn't really close the office for one yeah. day. And that's also make our some internal awareness and for the talent in the office, oh, Taiwan, what, 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 who is the Taiwan and where is the Taiwan <laughs> office? And they start to search our, uh, you know, the, some of the job hosting within our internal system. And right now, uh, right now in Taiwan, it's most like a union na nation. Uh, we have over 20 nationality works mm. in Taiwan, which almost like global uh, village. Yeah. So uh, if any talent want to join us, yeah, feel free to check a uh, Google career website. But I, think, I think we should not forget that Taiwan consistently ranks uh, as one of the most expert friendly exactly. countries in the world. Um, and you know what, this is getting provided by all these international business magazines and that definitely changed that landscape over here, especially in the last five years. And by the way, I'm also biased. I also, <laughs> have, a, I also have a pixel by six. The way, I'm, I'm sorry about that. This is not a pay. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're saying. not doing this. I, well, you know, yeah, they just happen to both have that phone. So. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, when it comes to being super expert friendly and, and so on and so forth, Sasha, you're probably speaking from your own personal yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. And I want to, before we end, I also want to invite you to speak from your own, maybe like more on the professional side. With your time here, what have you seen when it comes to observations or insights that you provide for your headquarters in mm -hmm. Europe mm -hmm. when it comes to influence mm. and impact and contribution for their global strategy? Yeah. I mean, when people think about a company like Daimler or Mercedes-Benz, well, they probably think about the three-pointed star, well, I like the one that I wear here. So yes, it's not a paid program over here. I'm not working for them anymore, but I'm still a fanboy. Um, but uh, Daimler as a whole was also a contributor to um, future mobility services. So for example, um, we've had an outsourced company, it was called Movil. They were working on a mobility app for urban areas, and but basically kind of creating individual mobility um, throughout various platforms. Uh, for me, the best feedback that I could give to them was just by explaining them how urban mobility works in a city like Taipei in this area and what they build up over here was first of all heavily driven by the payment system which is the easy cut which is in my opinion the super glue in between all the services that you have in a smart city the super glue in between all these mobility platforms and then, you know, with a company like Giant providing the U-Bike Giant, the biggest car manufacturer in the world with over 40% of market share, providing the U-Bike system to overcome the last mile, how it's connected then to a bus system, how it's connected to a subway and an MRT system. It kind of all comes together. It's a very holistic approach that we have over here, right? You don't have these kind of single pillars. Um, they looked at it from a perspective of the customer and the users, not from the perspective of a, 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 a singular company. That makes a huge difference. This was something they were super excited about, right? Because I truly believe, as much as I am a car lover and I love to drive, I truly believe that the future of mobility in urban areas is not about kind of individual cars that we own, right? This landscape is going to change. It's happening already here in Asia. Give you an idea. Um, there are only five profitable subway systems or six profitable subway systems in the world. Guess where they all are? They are all in Asia. Each and every subway system in the world besides it needs to get heavily subsidized to actually be operated. And this tells you a lot about how advanced mobility in an urban environment is in Asia. And they were super curious about this. So this definitely had an impact, yes. So city kind of like as a lab 
yeah. for mobility solution. Yeah. And not just for cities in Asia, but that can be kind of like an export in terms of the solution that we can provide for the world. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. kind of like what I'm hearing. And uh, you talk about U-Bike, obviously I'm the biggest fan, um, Easy Car, and also our um, subway system and so on and so forth. And also I think, you know, like you also talk about Gogoro before as well when it comes to, you know, what they have built. That, 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 that is definitely, for me personally, one of the most inspiring brands coming out of um, Taiwan. They actually are already made it over to, to, to Germany together with Bosch. They created a, a mobility service in Berlin with Coop. Um, but I truly believe um, the idea of Gogoro, what most people don't get, well, first of all, Taiwan, the density of scooters in Taiwan is second to none to any other country in the world. So this is all about scooters. I think we have like 20 million scooters uh, on an island with 23 million citizens. Right now, electric scooters have a market share of almost 20%, and by far the market leader is Gogoro. And um, the cool thing about Gogoro is, they have this battery swap system so it's a subscription based and then you know based on how much range you need each and every month you're going to pay for it just in taiwan we have more battery swap stations for gogoro scooters than tesla has uh, superchargers around the globe and I think this is absolutely amazing. I truly believe you know, um, that they are going to have a very, very global impact. And they are, I mean, they're already branching out. Yeah, it's really um, a shocking number that I think a lot of people probably are not aware of. And I think even for Google, you just recently launched this service to show how crowded yeah. the bus is yeah, yeah. I, I and I love it by I the just, way. I just want to on top of what Sasha just mentioned that uh, based on all this uh, mobility friendliness and yeah. what uh, because it's, uh, all overall Google's uh, product and service is actually still very identical uh, in every country. Yeah. But based on all all the facts, actually we we will be able to launch some of more eco friendly feature in Taiwan and last week uh, last month we just launched a, a so-called uh, Cowdis prediction a uh, stat on uh, Ban Chao Xian, which is yeah. Taipei Metro and this is just the world third city after New York and Sydney we can launch the, the new feature in Taiwan and right now I think uh, just what you mentioned that we still want to work with the other uh, public transportation uh, what how we can integrate all this uh, information on Google map and which probably not all, all, everyone own the vehicle, but you can kind of leverage, uh, make the best of use of a Google map to yeah. plan their route in a more economical and also sustainable way to have the choice. Yeah. And on this, just one last comment and maybe question, because I noticed that Taiwan is the number two or number three city that Google chose to launch this service, right? I yeah. think only after uh, New York and Sydney. Yes. Can you tell us why that's the case? Because I was obviously super excited about this. Um, but you know, like out of so many cities in the world, why yeah. was Taiwan chosen? Yeah, a few things. The first thing is about s consumer. Uh, Taiwan user really love Google Map. And uh, our Google Map kind of like uh, the penetration. Taiwan is also kind of among the top all over the world. And second thing is we really have a quite strong uh, public sector to work with because you do, if you don't really have a good data yeah. then you won't be able to integrate with our product to have this similar collaboration and not to mention that we also have very strong team uh, to work with the Taiwan government to make this uh, happen so it won't just okay with one factor it comes with several factors to make this uh, happen and we hope we still can continue to roll out some new services in Taiwan among the other location but this also rely on uh, open data and also some of the good infrastructure we can write on that to launch the new service which can really provide helpful feature yeah. for user in Taiwan. And, and this is why it's so important to have this open approach, this holistic approach because the services a company uh, like Google provides to this. By the way, you also have the U-Bike integrated in Google Maps, right? Which is obviously something that you like. Not for me in the district where I live, because if I would take the U-Bike uh, downtown, I have to go over some steep hills, so I still prefer to get on the MRT or on the bus, right? But still, I mean, 
you just integrated it just so quickly and just makes a difference to create an eco-friendly environment uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. But it is just so important that we have this kind of meta perspective on all the on all the different players that are in this landscape and how they can contribute to this kind of bigger good, which is basically making it more livable, making it more eco-friendly, and making it more, you know, sustainable in general for the citizens in an urban environment. And I think this is just an, a prime example of what is possible. I just love to use these services. And as soon as we have, when we have this usability in the market for me as a customer, I'm willing to use them more likely than just uh, uh, trying to carry myself uh, around mm. in two tons of steel mm. with some four wheels on this, which is in terms of efficiency, you know, what somewhere that is just so last millennium. I think that tie everything we talk about beautifully together. And yeah. we're gonna get into our Q&A sessions. I'm seeing a lot of questions already online. If you have questions now, you still have a chance to post them in the Q&A box. And if you can, let us know which speaker, if you have specific speakers that you, are, you want to direct your questions to, let us know as well. I'm gonna start with, I see a few questions in terms of you know, like we have been talking a lot about the strengths, advantages, competitiveness, and so on and so forth from Asia. But are there areas that we can still learn from either Silicon Valley or other parts of the world? What are some of the areas that we're still lacking or still falling behind? Uh, either in general, or I also see a question specifically around talent. You know, like um, Tina, you mentioned we have very rare combination when it, when it comes to hardware, software, integrated, and, and um, basically talents that are good at both. But are there areas that talent here can think a little bit more about? So, you know, like we talk about all of the pluses. Now maybe that's reflect upon some areas that we can think a little bit more to still learn and be open-minded with the world. Mm -hmm. Who would like to I can start? pick. I can pick this one. Um, what we want to focus a little bit about what the improvement area we can focus, right? I think the first thing is still about the global mindset. But the global mindset, it comes with how you define global. So, so sometimes uh, all this, if you just have a very limited about certain uh, culture and you, how you want to uh, provide the services and product for all the consumer all over the world, I think we still have the opportunity area to be better. This is the first one. And second one is about what we call problem solve, solving mindset. Um, in, in the past, like in Asia, we most like take the question from the top OEN, then okay, we want to solve the problem. So somehow we are kind of lack of how you define the problem or the opportunity you want to tackle. So it's more like, okay, you have a defined problem you want to solve, and I think Asian uh, talent or Taiwan talent, we are well trained for that. But if you want to innovate that, you need to know how to define the problem. Even sometimes the problem is ambiguous, right? So yeah. I think this is something, uh, I, I think we, we still have opportunity for that. And thirdly, is uh, I want to talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. And uh, probably I'm a female, <laughs> and I really noticed that um, in Asia or in Taiwan, we still haven't really unleashed the full power of the, the other side of the population. And some market or some country actually uh, female account for at least over 50% of population. But if when it comes to we want to have innovation product and why we cannot include all this uh, female talent into yes. the uh, development or even they can be a part or be a key part for the contribution. So uh, I th that what I would want to talk about wickedness. I think that will be the opportunity area. Um, I think no matter Asia or Taiwan can be uh, better. Yeah, so uh, global mindset, the ability to define questions and also this awareness to really embrace diversity and inclusion. 
those are uh, probably areas that we can think a little bit more about. Yeah. Sasha, anything you would like to add? Well, I would love to add something, uh, which was one of the main reasons why I got over here to Taiwan, because I truly believe that um, Taiwanese are the most humble people that I know, and very, very friendly and very, very welcoming. But sometimes I think um, a lot of young talents over here also need to develop some self-confidence. Let's say, I'm, I'm not talking about like being super bold, right? Um, because this could also have a negative impact. Um, let's call it self-confident humbleness, right? This would be something that I would definitely prefer over here. They are amazing talents. The problem is, of course, there are all these global OEMs. Just here, yeah, we're in, in, in Taipei right now. In, in, in a range of like 10 miles or 15, 16 kilometers, we can reach out to all these headquarters of the Acer, Asus, Gigabytes, whatever. And sometimes I felt it had a negative impact on the startup scene over here because you know what, these young engineers are coming out of university and they want to work for one of these big brands out of a sudden. And that wasn't really good for creating a new vibe here in the startup scene. So. Uh, be a little bit more confident uh, in the future and you know what on the other hand even an Acer and an Asus and a Gigabyte and a TSMC once started as a startup right so the opportunities are there especially in this ever-changing landscape that we have right now and I think you let us into the next question I would love to throw sort of like cover uh, in general for maybe the startup crowd out there uh, there are some questions about you know like a, a lot of time when we come when we talk about startups or entrepreneurship in Taiwan we talk about oh the market's too small and um, what Sasha just mentioned when it comes to maybe the mentality the humbleness we are not as good as selling our dream to the investors or to the world uh, can you share a little bit when it comes to maybe kind of like advice or suggestion and what you are seeing do you really think the market here is too small or like in uh, another comment is in the platform and cloud service era now you know like basically the world is becoming flat so exactly. what are you seeing you know like uh, when it comes to the startup ecosystem any suggestion or observations around that the question is really are there still regional markets in such industries or isn't this like you mentioned already the world is flat I truly believe that the world is flat. Now you have the chance, not, not only now, for the last 20 years, you had the chance to go global wherever you were, right? depending, of course, on the, on the business model. Um, and, and, and therefore, this creates amazing new opportunities over here. Also creates uh, new opportunities in the way you can reach out to other big brands out there and to let them know about your talent and what you have to offer. This is not only um, a way of how you're going to approach your customers, or potential customers. This is actually also how you gonna approach uh, when an HR department, for example, from Google. Yeah, whether you want to work here in Taiwan or whether you want to work in Mountain View or any other uh, market or region in the world. The world is flat. It's an amazing opportunity for young talents right now to participate in this and. I truly believe that the perspective and the mentality and mindset that is coming out of Asia will change the world for the good. Mm. Yeah. How about you, Tina? Like anything to add or echo when it comes to maybe young talents, startups, entrepreneurship? I think sometimes um, maybe we think global is too a uh, uh, very too broad concept. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes because you grown up in one country, then you how you define the world probably is okay. U.S. is the world or Europe is the world, but you just can think out outside of your home country probably just like a plus one or plus two. Then that also can be like an international uh, business beyond your home country. So. I think when we comes to uh, just like Sasha mentioned, because the world is o already flat, and definitely you want to focus on domestic market that you can have more in depth, a uh, differentiation to provide the value for local user. But certain thing that you want to have a network effect, definitely scale will be one key element that you need to think about. But sometimes uh, when we come up with some idea that if you you don't think outside of your home market 
to think about okay, why we, we can, how this, uh, these services can be uh, to provide for some people outside your home country. Probably the switch the concept or mindset a little bit, then it can be uh, one area that we can work on for the stop. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. And now I want to get into some specific questions around circular economy and even like M F NFT, AR, VR. Um, one specific question for Tina. So because, you know, like for Sasha, you work on AWARE, this platform focusing on ESG, ESG and obviously very important topic. We haven't really touched up on much when it comes to Google uh, and maybe your plan in this area uh, when it comes to sustainability. So there is a question specifically around Google in terms of whether you have plans to make your products also recyclable as well, and maybe just in general, your plans or, or goals, commitment when it comes to ESG. Okay, there's a few area what uh, Google has to be committed. One thing is our CEO Sundar has announced that like, uh, definitely sustainability by 2020, 20, uh, 2030, that will be a moonshot goal for Google. And then we will fo fo uh, focus on a few things. The one thing is actually our solution can enable our partner and user to be sustainable. For example, some services or some uh, technology, they can leverage our traffic or their, our cloud infrastructure to make some sustainable uh, service for their own business. So that will be one area. Second thing, we just talk about uh, some of our consumer product like uh, Google Maps. And they also can enable user to have sustainable choice for when they choose what the transportation route they want to have. And we will roll out more sustainable feature on Google Map in the future to help all the user. And not to mention because Taiwan, we are kind of one of a big uh, highway hub uh, among the globe. And some of our highway product, we already have some uh, economic friendly uh, kind of design for our product. And right now, even as a Googler in Taiwan, actually our workplace is also trying to be uh, eco-friendly. For example, uh, we, when we into a meeting room, once the people leave the room, the light will automatically mm. off. And some of the little design, it also come with the big thing. So we continue to innovate and also optimize our workplace for a more eco-friendly uh, workplace for all the Googlers, not just only Taiwan office, but all over the world. So we will continue to see what the area in terms of uh, capability we can de deliver to enable not only for us, for our customer and even ecosystem to be more sustainable. And, and if I'm uh, allowed to add this, um, when I look at your products right now, when I look at the life cycles, and I always said, you know, I truly believe we need to finally uh, get into the era of the platform economy. This also means that the life cycles of the products that we're actually using needs to become longer. So uh, when it comes to smartphones, for example, um, there is a ranking or a benchmark made by iFixit, uh, which are these guys that are uh, looking at the repairability of a handset. And, and your latest platform, the Pixel 6, is really ranking on top of it. Plus, on top of it, uh, uh, besides that, it's also um, for how long are you actually providing uh, operating system updates? Uh, security updates. So with Google, I think it's like five years right now. This is going to have a huge impact on um, the overall uh, environment, environment and how, how eco-friendly are we becoming. So I can definitely see that shift in this industry right now because you know what, they, they are also trying to attract now a young audience that is going to protest each and every Friday right on the streets all around the world and these are going to become the customers of the future when you look at the change that uh, an organization like Fridays for Future uh, did towards this world and if I would just also um, bring this into the automotive industry right these young kids that are protesting right now they are the future customer maybe for a Mercedes-Benz in 15 to 20 years if you can't provide a climate neutral and eco-friendly product at that time, you are probably not going to sell into this market. 
Exactly, exactly. And now I want to change gear a little bit because I think none of the events these days can finish without talking about NFT, crypto, and maybe metaverse. So obviously we have some questions around that. And I want to pick your brand in terms of your general thoughts. Obviously, if there are specific things that you want to talk about when it comes to maybe your product development or future plans, feel free. But we have questions specifically around uh, NF NFTs, crypto, and also obviously now um, with the AR VR developments, specifically there's a question about how soon do you think AR VR advertising will become a norm in the markets? And uh, maybe for Sasha, any general thoughts around this? And then maybe, you know, like if I were to expand this question a little bit uh, from just NFT and, and crypto to the whole kind of like blockchain decentralized infrastructure mm. when it comes to application in the supply chain. Mm. I'm also curious in terms of whether you are seeing any applications or discussion around that when it comes to ESG. So, who would like to go first? Well, well, I can, well, I can, I can kick it off. Uh, don't want to be rude or whatever. I think sometimes when it comes to NFT and crypto, besides a handful or maybe a dozen blockchains that we have in the market for cryptocurrencies and NFTs, uh, we also see a lot of fairy tales that will stay fairy tales for a long time. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, well, comparing this to what's happening in the Bitcoin, um, ERC space, etc., um, Cardano and all of these guys. Um, same with NFTs. Like I mentioned already earlier, we have a younger generation that is very, very eager to embrace digital goods. Right. And when it comes to NFTs, and if you uh, look at the gaming industry, there's obviously a huge market for this. There's obviously a huge market for the blockchain, also in the supply chain. Um, we are moving towards an industry where each and every part of uh, the supply chain will be on a blockchain and will be traceable because we also can add additional information towards this. Where are the warmest, uh, warm materials uh, being sourced and, and, and all of this? And how can we recycle this in the future? And so, yes, it's going to happen. But once again, we are basically right now in the kind of gold rush era. Right. We were still trying to figure out it's a huge hype and it's a huge trend and whatnot. And the blockchain at the end of the day is somewhat a little bit of a database, a transparent database. Um, regarding AR and VR, this is quite interesting because now out of a sudden someone coined this name of the metaverse. Um, I think AR and VR, well, I played with a Game Boy Virtual in the late 80s. Yeah. And uh, Steve Mann, uh, an engineer at the MIT, uh, worked around uh, VR glasses for the last 35 years or something. The biggest problem for this industry right now, they still didn't have their, I would say, World of Warcraft or GTA Online moment, right? There isn't this killer application right now that wants me to get and I don't know how many generations of VR and AR glasses I have at home, but it really wants me to engage with this metaverse right now. This will change because I, the question was also kind of referring to advertisement in the AR and VR space. There's advertisement all around the world in the gaming industry, in the gaming space. So this would kind of scale up into the VR space sooner or later. But right now, the biggest problem is as long as AR and VR is not uh, the industry is not providing the right content, but also not providing the right hardware. Uh, obviously, I'm wearing glasses, right? As soon as this is turning into a device like this, an extension of my body that I just don't want to take off anymore, um, it will be a niche market. And uh, history has been showing us exactly this, but I'm still looking forward mm. to this. It's going to happen. So Tina, do you think it's still a niche market or obviously with Google, from Google Glass, the cardboard, and there has been, I guess, generations of commitment and trials into this space. I'm also curious in terms of what you're seeing 
yeah. when it comes to the, the first thing is because currently even like like what we still cannot overcome the battery challenge yes right so I still cannot imagine w what a consumer want to wear one bucket thing that recharge the glass over time. And it's ju not just only Google Glass, but some of the VR headset right now. I think it's still now is really user friendly for uh, this moment. And, and not to mention that if we cannot conquer this challenge and for the user friendliness uh, perspective, uh, the adoption will be still uh, slow uh, in terms of how they gonna to use it. And the second thing is about, uh, I won't say this is Google perspective, it is more like my own perspective. I still think that the technology still need to consider what the humanity aspect, right? So, so when we say, okay, who is the real person, right? So I think this is a lot of, I would say philosophical debate mm. and how, because I really believe that technology can become a really good thing that to enable people's life. But uh, how this will evolve and what kind of direction and we want to have a more like a greater good or it's just for pleasure or this is for the commercial use. I, 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 right now I feel this is still undefined. So kind of echo what uh, Sasha mentioned, still like a gold rush period. But we're still we're watching out how the technology can help. But uh, definitely I still want to become more like, uh, you know, greater good type of uh, usage. I love that, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. And by the way, uh, in the enterprise uh, uh, industry and business, it looks quite differently. Um, in, in Daimler plants, we had Google Glasses all over the place, right? I also have two generations of Google Glass. So especially when we um, try to educate people working on new machinery, now we saw a huge advantage by using uh, Google Glass or the Microsoft HoloLens, for example, and how we're going to, you know, kind of teach them on new machinery. But what I really love what Tina just said, this kind of philosophical approach, and I truly believe that you are absolutely right. I believe, I mean, we are in a very, very monetary system right now, and I truly believe that we have to transform into a more of a resource-based society. Technology as a whole is the key enabler to do that. If you would imagine more and more industries would uh, sooner or later kind of move into the metaverse, however we're going to define it in the future, but then we are talking about well, what are the resources to keep um, the metaverse uh, going. Yes, we still have to build hardware, but then we need energy. And if as soon as we have uh, only regenerative energy sources and green energy sources, that means uh, we can do business in an environment that is having much less of an impact on this planet as our monetary system, where we are in, where it's all about these goods and whatnot. And I said in, a, in our uh, um, a talk before we started this panel that I, since I saw this Marie Kondo uh, series on Netflix for the first time, I got rid of two thirds of my belongings. Because at the end of the day, does it make a difference if I have 10 pairs of sneakers or only two pairs of sneakers? I've never ever uh, bumped into a person that was capable of wearing two pairs of sneakers at the same time. Yeah? So we, we're moving towards this. I truly believe that technology is the enabler of it and we're looking forward to this. So I guess at the end of the day, we should really come back to this more human-centric sort of mm -hmm. like um, starting point and not in a way get carried away with all this fancy, sexy technology. Obviously, great possibilities this Pandora box um, can provide with us, but still come back to the core. And either when it comes to um, the lack of maybe talent or ideal battery technologies or energy and, and so on and so forth, I guess one thing maybe for sure is that whenever we have that best products, Chances are Taiwan is going to play an important role when it comes to that. So I have no doubt about that. Before we end, I want to ask one last question. There is an, um, an audience asking about, we, we have been talking a lot about the innovation from Asia and maybe what the reasons possible kind of like drives when it comes to that. Uh, people always love predictions. So I'm curious in terms of, I guess, you know, like the question is, is around five trends. Five is a lot, but just kind of like maybe a couple of trends that you see from Asia that will basically kind of like have 
global impacts. So I see Sasha thinking quite hard. Five is a lot. Five is a lot. <laughs> we can, you know, whatever come out from, from your head in terms of the key trends from, from this part of the world. I have to, I, I, I have to start once again uh, with my opening remarks about uh, the comp competitive landscape in the semiconductor um, and business because this is going to allow us to create more efficient, smaller, and always on devices. You know, as soon as um, I, I would call it uh, the the platforms that are creating um, an era of ambient computing, where the device as a whole is not so important anymore, but the accessibility of it is becoming the main driver for a world where computing is everywhere around us. So, and this is going to happen as it's beautiful, um, a movie that's already almost like 10 years old uh, 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 with River Phoenix, I think her, right, where, it, where it's all about um, a voice assistant, Google, one of the main drivers. I think the first time I was at uh, uh, Google, um, uh, the last time I was at the Google I.O., four or five years ago, um, your CEO mentioned it's not only mobile first anymore, it's AI first. And he is absolutely right. You were the first ones to really make this claim. So computing will be all around this. Um, so we need efficiency for this. We need the right uh, um, chipsets for this. And we need 5G. Right? Yes, right now 5G is all about, we have this amazing bandwidth. We have this low latency. It's everywhere. But what are the applications that we use on top of it? So right now it just basically means I can download files even faster than before on 4G plus or whatnot, which was already insanely fast over here. And uh, uh, probably faster than 90% of the broadband internet that other people have around the world. So these are my major trends. I truly believe in efficiency, semiconductor, and 5G. Maybe let me, let me uh push it forward a little bit, especially when it comes to the mobility sector. Do you think the suppliers in Asia is going to change the, the game plan when it comes to automotive manufacturing? Well, I think they have to. Uh, here is something I remember uh, when, 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 when a company like Tesla came to the market and I saw all these articles around the world and they're going to kind of basically kill the traditional OEMs. I've never seen it this way. Um, I've been actually uh, seeing them as a, this kind of transformer for this industry. And gosh, this old OEM industry really needed a company like Tesla to wake up, to be honest. Um, but now, for example, look at a, a new player. Well, not a new player, but a new player for the automotive industry. When you look at the plans from Foxconn mm -hmm. and what they're going to contribute to this market, uh, if Foxconn is cracking the code, and I truly believe they're going to do this, in coming up with white-labeled cars, that is also going to enable a whole new industry. And this will be all about brands to say, you know what, hey, Foxconn, we are Louis Vuitton, and we want to have a special series of 50,000 Louis Vuitton EVs now in the market. We know you can do this. This is how it should look like. This is our corporate design for the software. These are the services that we want to provide to it. This is going to really change the landscape. I think right now, the automotive industry has no idea what's coming for them. Great. All right, you know, I think that can be one of our future episodes. But before that, <laughs> Tina, what's your prediction? I think one thing uh, Sasha just mentioned about the manufacturing capability, that's also why so many uh, global economies start to consider, okay, we need to have a manufacturing industry based in their hometown, right? So I think that's a capability. You want to make something happen, then I think that will be the one of the key strengths in our region. And second thing is I also think about because uh, what I just mentioned about the younger generation and how they define a brand, mm -hmm. right? For example, you just mentioned about Tesla or Mercedes-Benz. But if you are t asking one, uh, you know, 20 years old young kids, they say, okay, I don't really think the Mercedes is a brand, uh, Tesla is a brand. So mm -hmm. 
because right now we are using our view to see what the ma brand means but for younger generation they will use what they first experience the product yeah. to define what the brand means for them yeah. so i really think that in the region that probably will change the so-called global brand landscape totally and some new emerging brand will come from asia and some of i would say the you know 100 years brand also be need to be aware that th th this will be yeah. something and not to mention the all the business transformation disruption and what get you here won't get you there mm. and and i think that for the pandemic and even for the global uh you know like all this geopolitical type of uh, dynamic will also change the how you define the global business yeah, yeah. i agree so i guess to conclude what get you here will not get you there and the disruption more of that is coming from asia for sure and i guess you know like with that we're pretty much out of time but I want to thank you both again. What an amazing session. And also thanks all of our engaging um, audiences online. We still have a lot of questions that we couldn't cover, kind of as usual. But thank you so much. And please look out for the event recap and video recording through our emails and across the social media channels with Digitimes and Anchor Taiwan. I want to thank you for all of your support this year with the Asia Venturing session, now the six, number six of all of the sessions. Any feedback, please feel free to reach out to me or our team members at Digitimes or Anchor Taiwan. And uh, you know, feel free to send me a linking with a note. I would love to connect. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tina and Sasha again. Greetings from Taipei, and we hope to see you again very soon in 2022. Have a nice day and wonderful holiday seasons ahead. Bye-bye.